Peter Lynch was one of the smartest investors that the world has ever seen. He got a return of 29.2% while being an investment manager of the Magellan Fund, making it the best performing mutual fund in the world. In this video, I'm going to show you a clip of Peter Lynch talking about high stock market prices and what to do. Peter Lynch is highly regarded as one of Wall Street's legendary money managers. He ran Fidelity's Magellan Fund from 77 to 90. At the end of his 13-year helm, it was up over 2,700 percent and had become the world's largest mutual fund. He remains on the board of trustees at the Fidelity Group and is vice chairman of Fidelity Management and Research. His new <laughs> CD-ROM uh, is called The Stock Shop with Peter Lynch and its strategies to invest in the stock market with confidence. All the profits for this go to charity, I think. He joins me now to talk about the remarkable record volume day on Wall Street and other matters of investing. And I am very pleased to have him back at this table. Welcome back. Hey, Charlie, good to see you. Now, smart of me, smart of me to schedule <laughs> you ago. on a day like this. Three months ago, I said, when do you want Lynch to come in? Right. I said, let's get him on Tuesday. Something's going to happen in the market that week. And so here we are. Glad to be here. Explain to me what's going on. Well, we had a huge run. I mean, the market was 4,000 just you know, two and a half years ago, yeah. and it ran up to 8,300 in August. And, you know, like any big rally, sometimes it backs off. I mean, it's healthy. In fact, I mean, I'd rather have gone down 1,000 points than gone to 12,000. If you look at Japan, Japan went from 5,000 to 15,000 on their Dow, and it was fairly priced at 15,000 on earnings and everything else. Mm -hmm. Then it went to 40,000, and that caused seven years of inflated real estate, people overspending. And basically, they've been in a recession for five or six years because their market went up too high. I mean, if the market goes up too high, I mean, if, if the market goes too high, you're, you're discounting earnings seven, eight, ten years out. There's a so relationship. everything is overpriced. Yeah, and that doesn't help anything. The market since World War II has sold between ten times earnings and twenty times earnings. If you look at the Dow Jones or the S&P 500, if you add up all the companies and take the earnings, you say there's a relationship. And it follows. McDonald's earnings have been terrific the last 30 years, and the stock's been terrific. There's a direct relationship. So the earnings of the S&P 500 have been between this range of 10 and 20. We were just about to go over the 20, which is the high end of the PE range. There wasn't a lot of so room left PE on the PE So PE of 20 is, too, is, is at the it's top peak. of high, high it should ever be. Right. It's been over there only a few times ever over 20. And that's yeah. when usually inflation is about zero. In the early 60s, when inflation was about zero, we got a little bit over 20. Now we have a very low inflation rate. So if you usually have subtracted inflation from 20, you've had the PE of the market. That's been a pretty good ratio. When inflation was 12%, you remember in the early 80s, we had an 8 or 9 PE yeah. of the market. So Dr. Lynch says all of this has been good for us? Well, it's like I'm a, telling you, it would not have been helpful. It's, it's like a burger or something. I never thought I'd ever wish for the market to not go up dramatically. But well, let's, just, let's argue the market went to 16000 tomorrow. Yeah. Basically, there is earnings behind companies. Okay, but I'm not arguing that. I know that's true. And, and that would be crazy. And, yeah. and stock market price ought to be dictated by earnings and Absolutely. earnings performance and future earnings potential. That's right? right. That's right. I got that. Even I got that. Right. Now, let's just take this for me. Sure. Uh, was the decline yesterday, in a sense, it let off some of this overvaluation. The market right, was even right. overvalued at where it was. Right. And by letting it off, right. then we got back to what was reasonable. Well, yeah, I would say fairly priced. Maybe for the larger companies, they're now OK. There might be some small companies. I mean, we've had 3,000 companies come public the last four years. That's two a business day. Yeah. Some of those companies have gone down dramatically. And, and that's sort of a research zone that average people in the stock shop, that's what we can find. Some people know a lot about this, 10,000 public companies. A lot of them are very attractive. No one's following them. And there's lots of people following IBM. Well, that's lots how you of people got following companies that nobody else followed, right? right. I, I'd like to go to see companies with unions or companies in trouble or companies that no one looks Hotels at. Hotels that had nice beds. And, well, yeah, and you have you to know, look at a lot of them. Or pantyhose your wife wore. I that's remember the story. Oh, okay, you got Pier 1 Imports. My wife <laughs> yeah, found that one, too. But, but you have to look at 20 to find one. It's just you don't you know, go to the mall and find the stock. I mean, you have to say, my God, this sounds like it's good. And then you have to do some steps. You have to do an organized method. People are careful when they buy a toaster. Careful, they're careful when they buy a seat. They do. They do yeah, some research. But they don't do it with stock. They it's call up the broker or they see somebody at lunch and they say, man, I got this hot stock. Yeah. And you run right out and you spend $5,000, yeah, uh, small yeah. investors. Yeah. Or they, even worse, they put an option in international data whack. They don't even own international <laughs> data whack. So they have a 90-day play. <laughs> but it's Bill like said it was good and they make a lot of money. Right, right. And it's, a, and it's like a casino. Yeah. So it's like a casino. You get the same results as if there's more paperwork. Right. But yeah. just stay with me in terms of people who are bedazzled by what's happened. Right. If you look at yesterday. And you look at today, right. nothing has happened in the fundamentals of economics right. of any company. Right, right. But their well, stock may have gone down 10% well, yesterday and up 5 right. today. One modest point, though. I mean, every time you, get, you have to get a memory, it's like it gets very cold in the winter in some parts of the country. You get a memory that winter's coming. <laughs> there, something right. did really happen in Southeast Asia. I mean, those yeah, are, it did. Those that, are economies. Was that the cause of what happened in this market? Well, though? I think so. That was the reminder saying, by the word, you know, profits can go down. I mean, there is a downside. But, but why was that the cause? I mean, did, did what's happening in Southeast Asia affect the earnings potential of all these companies you're talking about? It did. Because in, they can't sell their products way, there? In a small way. No, because those economies have been growing double digit. 
and all of a sudden now they're going because of bank problems, because they're yeah. overfinanced, they're under leveraged. I mean, they're going to have they're going to have to draw on their belts. Those part, and then people said, "Whoa, maybe that'll become it'll happen." China is now the fourth largest economy in the world. Maybe China can go in recession. So this sort of woke people. It was like a wake up call, saying, "Whoa, maybe there's a chance earnings can go down." I mean, this is not a big deal for the United States. When Mexico went down, much more important. But it sort of said people. Why was it much more important? Well, Mexico much, more much important more, to Mexico. Much Mexico more important is much to more us. important to the United States than Thailand is, or the Philippines. Or any, their economy yeah, is yeah, very yeah, important yeah. to us. They're right. a big consumer. Very important. They're our neighbor. A lot of people there. Right. That's a very important. When that went down, that affected Latin America was more important. So the, the recession of 1990. But it sort of reminded people. They'd say, "Wait a second. There is a downside. We have re we've had nine recessions since World War II. We'll have other ones." Tell me what took place overnight between yesterday at the close of market and today at the beginning of market. What were the guys that you used to work with saying to each other at Fidelity, and what were the people you know right, saying? Right. For example, IBM made a decision right, right. to buy back their stock, right, right. and that pre presented some kind of push on the market, and their right. stock went up six points. Well, one thing you're trying to do is That's say, of all people. these public companies out there, here's the company I really like. The fundamentals are terrific. Their earnings are doing well. Their competitors are doing poorly. I think this company's doing terrific. And all of a sudden, the stock might have gone from 40 to 30 because of this decline. That would say, wow, here's a chance to buy it. So you're trying to say some companies might have been overpriced at 60, and all they did was go to 50, and you say, big deal. So you're trying to find companies you liked anyway. Right now, you liked them. And now they've had a haircut. Mm -hmm. That's what you would do. You're not, not a stock that went from overpriced to fairly priced. Something that was fairly priced at the start of this exercise, and then had a very, you know, a five for four sale. You know. If you had been managing the Magellan Fund this morning, yes. you would have been buying like crazy? I would have been researching like crazy. I would have been saying, which companies are the same story? Is there anything really happening? This is a non-event for them. They're still doing well. Even if we have a recession, there's nothing to do with them. And, and that's the kind of kinds I'm trying to buy. But let's say if a company, just think of it, this as being, you say to yourself, I think this company's going to earn something in the future. If it's already discounting that, if it's selling at a huge multiple, you say, it's already, it has to work. And then it's only going to stay even. So you have to say to yourself, if I'm right, how much am I going to make? If I'm wrong, how much am I going to lose? That's the risk-reward ratio. In stock shop, we talk about, if I'm right, I hope I'm going to double trip my money. If I'm wrong, may I lose 30 40%. That's a favorable ratio. But you say, if I'm right, the stock's not going to go up. It's already discounting terrific things. If discounting terrific things are already in the stock, I don't want to know. Okay, it. so this morning you get up and you go in and you look at, at those companies that, that fit you, that. That you know something about. You have to have an itch. I mean, you, let's say the cement industry goes from crummy to semi-crummy <laughs> to fairly good. Yeah. The stocks are going north. Right. You're going to make money. That's the industry you know. What if you know the publishing industry? You're, you, some people, have, you have an itch. You work. I mean, what if your last 30 years you worked in the restaurant industry? You would have seen Taco Bell. Right. You would have seen Sabaros. Right. You would have seen Pizza Hut. You would have seen Chili's. You would have seen these companies doing very well. You should have bought those instead of trying to buy biotechnology stocks exactly. you know nothing about. I mean, I know nothing about local area networking. A lot of people are buying this Cisco. They're buying the equipment, saying, we're going to root together all these peripherals and we're going to put together the servers. Well, they, but, but that's not a bad buy because they own a huge percentage of their market. You know what? That was, they're saying only a few people have that money. My God, if it works for us, other people will try it, then colleges will try it, high schools will try it, then they'll go overseas. They knew they were early in the ball game, right. And they should have been buying that company instead of out buying something they don't know anything about, some oil drilling company. I mean, people have this tendency to always buy something they don't. All, all you right. need is a okay. few. Charlie, all you need is a few good stocks. Yeah, but this is your song. This has been no, your song no, for a long time. No, but Only buy what you know. No, but people wake up in the morning and say, there's 5,000 companies out there. Which one should I buy? The, the average person ought to be able to follow four or five companies. They ought to be able to lecture on them. They right. understand the companies. And this forces you. This tool says you write down the story. All right, but you keep saying this. The stock shop is what? What is it? This is a CD-ROM that you plug into your CD-ROM right, and right. play through your... Right. PC, and you come up with what? Well, also, it's a data stream. You can update information on five or 6,000 companies right like that. You can get 10 years of uh, financial data, 10 years of income statements, 10 years of inventory. So you can get updates on all these companies. But that's what you get on a Bloomberg terminal. No, but it's only right now. And you know, it doesn't pick 50 data points. It doesn't go over five years. This, on the companies you want to look at, it'll give you all the information. Out of this? It costs $6.95 a month in addition, and it's a, you get a free oh, trial. Oh, I see. I you get, get a free trial. We okay. get a cut rate deal, and you can also <laughs> buy it. You can get it from Fidelity for special programs. But this yeah. is something, this will help you update it. So you can say, this is something I want to look at, and I want to see what are the cash looks like. And if you don't understand what cash is, if you don't understand what debt is, I always said, let's say you're looking at companies that are doing poorly, that they're not doing very well. Why don't you buy the one that has $300 million in cash instead of the one that's almost bankrupt? I mean, a lot of companies are selling at 2 or $3 a share. They might be losing $10 well, million. That's a dollars. brainer, isn't it? But people don't do it. And well, they don't this, do it because they don't know how to do the research. Well, with this, be... you can look up the balance sheet and say, listen, they got $300 million in cash. They're losing $10 million a quarter. They'll be okay. Yeah. This other company's got no, no cash, $700 million in debt. They're yeah. about to blow taps. But, but you're company. telling every small investor in America anyway they ought to invest in a mutual fund, aren't you? I'm telling you you can do both. 
you ought to you could be investing in mutual funds and occasionally you should be able to find a stock that's going to make a difference in your life if it's an industry you know something about the industry or local company I mean, there's a lot of people that said they sell the Kinta Motorins in Texas they said my god I mean there are a lot of people have seen local companies so. friendlies I, there's been companies come along yeah. locally the people made St. Jude Medical made a lot of money for people what in, was that motel you stayed in and then you went and bought a bunch of it yeah La Quinta Motorins was that La Quinta that's yeah, what it was right you yeah. stayed overnight there and, and I said, also got advice from somebody that was a competitor there's so a Holiday Inn guy saying this guy boy they're killing us they're tough you know so that way, you get a lot of information. Don't throw right. it away. All right. Let, before you go, uh, okay. uh, so what? You buy this thing, and is it going to charity or not? Well, all my profits. I mean, Houghton Mifflin is the person marketing this, and they, oh. they're they're keeping some profits. You on. haven't made them yeah, a charitable right. company. And, and, and the company at the uh, the company that's selling it. The if you go to Borders or you go to Coffee yeah. USA, they're not. They're name. Everything I've done, all my books and on this, my wife and I could do everything to charity. Is this because you made a bunch of money, and so therefore, what you do now, you want well, to be? That's part of it. I, it's, but also, even if I hadn't made a bunch of money, I'd like to see people do a better job. These are people. I mean, used oh, to well. when so you used you, to retire. Your crusade is to influence the investing habits of America. To do, have them do a better job. If they're not ready to do it properly, they shouldn't do it. And, and used to be, used to be able to retire, and you get half of your last year's salary. Yeah. You'd have a pension. You could rely on that. Now you have to do it for yourself. Some people are presented. They're but they're let go by their early retirement, and they're given five hundred thousand dollars, and they say, "This is it. This is your retirement, lady. You're going to take care of it now." And some people have lost all that money in options in the last three months. So what you're saying to people today about the future of the market over the near term is what? What's your feeling? We can take I got to buy business. We can about take a coin out and flip it. I have no idea what the next thousand points is going to do. The next six thousand points going to be up. The next 14,000 points can be up. The next 20,000 points can be up. But you don't know what the next 1,000 is going to be. It Nobody could be does. down, could be up. Could Nobody be... does. And, and it's futile to try and guess it. Corporate profits will be a lot higher 10 years from now. They'll be a lot higher 20 years from now. That's what you could rely on. Microsoft didn't exist 20 years ago. Staples didn't exist 20 years ago. Federal Express didn't exist 20 years ago. New companies will come along. That's Cisco what makes stocks didn't exist 20 years ago. That's what makes Amgen has two $1 billion drugs. They didn't exist 20 years ago. New companies will come along. That's what makes this country work. You've got to keep your eyes open. Okay, no. is the game over in Asia? No, God, no. That, you can't. You know, some of these countries have a 56% savings rate. They have a high literacy rate. The game's not over. The, you know, they're going to they're have to. But have they lost something? Well, they're going to have to. You know, than some of their lending, they got carried away. There's. I mean, they're going to have to. You know, step back, figure it out, and go ahead. It's certainly not over in Asia. No way. So emerging markets is still a big deal. Right, big deal. What about all the criticism of derivatives and the, and the impact they have had? That's a little complicated for me. I, all I know is, I mean, <laughs> I don't know about derivatives. It's complicated for you. It's way over my head. I've never bought an option <laughs> in my life. I never bought I, Time's on your side when you own a stock. You know, I don't know about putting, you know, 3% down and buying a future and a strap and a straddle. That's way over my head. Can't, can't deal with that. <laughs> is that right? Let somebody else deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you're optimistic about the future of the American economy. Earnings potential for right. most well-run companies will do all right. But people have to understand we've had nine recessions since World War II. We'll have other recessions. But we're not in one now. But we may goodness. have one in the future, and don't get worried about it. We'll have one. Sometime it'll happen, and we'll, no one will tell you when it's going to happen. It's just, well, but won't the fundamentals tell you? No, you'll find out after the fact. You'll, all of a sudden, you'll notice orders slowing, prices get more competitive, then earnings are down. I mean, usually you find out after that. No one declares. Everybody's been saying we're going to have a recession for five years. It just hasn't happened. It's great to see you. I okay, hope you'll Charlie. come back anytime, Peter. Excellent. Thank Thanks. you Thanks, very Charlie. much. One of the first things that you'll notice in the interview is they talked about market PE ratios. Whenever the market gets to a PE ratio above 20, you need to be on your toes. Now, that's exactly the market that we're currently in. The S&P 500 is well above that 20 mark. Now, that means prices are high. There's no doubt about it. So the question is, how do we invest in these conditions? As Lynch talked about in the interview, buy good quality businesses that are outperforming their competition. These are the ones that are going to survive a potential crash. Secondly, check that their balance sheet sheets are stable and preferably have a little bit of cash on them for tough times. Third, you've got to understand the company that you own. You know, you wouldn't buy a local business in your town if you didn't understand it. And it should be the exact same thing with a publicly traded stock. Lastly, remember that good times only last so long. So just make sure that you are prepared financially and emotionally for if a crash does happen because most people aren't prepared for one. And if you are, well, you'll beat most investors.